It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck, episode 22. How to strategize workshops with casting directors, agents, and managers to achieve your acting goals with John Marco Cerezi. It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck. Turn your passion into income. Ben will show you how with all the resources that you need to make it as an actor in an expensive city. Welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. I'm Ben Houck, and every week on this podcast, we cover topics related to earning an income as an actor. Thanks so much for listening. And hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, click the subscribe button on iTunes or in your podcasts app, and you'll get weekly episodes as they come out. This is episode 22, titled, How to Strategize Workshops with Casting Directors, Agents, and Managers to Achieve Your Acting Goals, with John Marco Cerezi. The show notes for this episode have all the important links referenced in today's show, which you can pull up right now at actingincome.com slash episode 22. And now, here's a word from today's sponsor, the FICOR Workbook. Just, just, just before you join an acting union, I want to recommend a book I created for you. It's called the FICOR Workbook. The FICOR Workbook talks about the United States Supreme Court backed right to pay a union only for collective bargaining. So you can work union jobs, but also work non-union jobs without the union punishing you. That right is called FICOR, and if you're a professional actor, it's important for you to know how your career might change if you go union, for better or for worse. And what's great is the FICOR workbook is a downloadable ebook, so you can start reading it moments from now to get educated about what union membership could do for your acting career. Consult your tax preparer to see if the FICOR workbook is a full tax write-off for your acting business. To download the FICOR workbook right now, visit FICORcentral.com slash workbook. That's FICORcentral.com slash workbook. Let's talk. If you had an infinite amount of money, you'd have enough resources to do whatever you wanted. But more than likely, you don't have an infinite amount of money. You have a finite amount of cash. And if you're an actor... Unless you're one of the luckier ones, you are quite aware of just how finite that amount of cash you have is. What happens when you have a finite amount of cash and a somewhat rational mindset, your money becomes more valuable to you. That is, you want to spend it in the most effective ways, in ways that will really clearly benefit you. You definitely don't want to waste it. Wasting your money sucks. So when you spend money on your acting career, you want to make sure that it isn't $200 on something that does nothing for your acting career. You want to spend $200 and have it do something for your acting career. And if you can spend $150 instead and have it have the same effect, well, that's grand. Today we're going to talk about another controversial topic, but we're not going to so much address its controversy. We're just going to take it for granted. We're going to talk about casting director workshops. We're also going to talk about agent-manager workshops. If you don't know what these are, these are things where you go somewhere to meet a casting director or agent or manager, you've plopped down an amount of cash, and you spend some time with that casting director or agent or manager. Maybe you do a monologue, maybe you do a scene, maybe you meet with a person for five minutes one-on-one, or maybe you get to attend a group Q&A to later have five minutes one-on-one. Or maybe you take a group class where everyone gets up and works directly with the casting director or agent or manager. These kinds of workshops, notably the ones with casting directors, are controversial because the thinking goes, casting directors bring actors in for auditions, which for the actor is the real world equivalent of a job interview. And if you're paying to meet a casting director, well, you can probably quickly see that it would be pretty corrupt to pay for a job interview or to give money to someone who might be able to get you a job interview. These kinds of workshops aren't that controversial when they are long classes with real work and with really good teaching. The thing is, sometimes they're not. And often they can be pretty expensive. Sometimes they're just a few minutes with a person, nothing much is really said, and nothing really could be learned. You get five minutes with the casting director, and when you're done, you're $60 poorer. But that's the controversy in a nutshell. For now, they're a way of life. And for the typical actor in the big city, workshops are an excellent way to take your career in your own hands and not feel as if your success is totally random or wholly out of your control. And since you probably have a finite amount of money and want to spend it in the most effective way possible, 
Any great advice to help you strategize your approach to workshops to save you money and maybe expedite your success as an actor is more than welcome. That's where today's guest comes in. John Marco Cerezi is an actor who pitched this episode idea some time ago, and I'm thrilled we finally got to talking. John Marco spent a god awful amount of money on workshops over the course of a year. During his experience, he started to learn things about workshops, evolve his strategies, refine his goals, and really build a team of representatives from the workshops he attended, not to mention build his acting career. He'd wished he'd learned what he learned sooner because it would have saved him quite a bit of money. Well, as my guest today, John Marco is going to share what he learned over the course of a year spending so much on workshops so you can save that money and strategize how you approach workshops with casting directors, agents, and managers and not spend the staggering amount of money he did. While the show notes have a lot of the links referenced in today's show, you're going to want to grab a pen and paper and take notes during this interview. While you're rustling around for those, here's John Marco's bio. John Marco Cerezi is an actor, stand-up comedian, and playwright. Recent credits include CBS's Blue Bloods, ABC's What Would You Do, Investigation Discovery's A Crime to Remember, Ensemble Studio Theater's 35th Marathon of One Act Plays, and That Bachelorette Show off-Broadway. His play, Less Than 50%, premiered in 2014's New York International Fringe Festival and was selected for the Encore series where it was optioned for an off-Broadway revival later in 2015. His award-winning web series, An Actor Unprepared, can be seen in full at and actorunprepared.com. John Marco currently writes and performs sketches for Cerezi and Sass and Uncle Function, and he does stand up all around New York City. And now, ready your pens and paper. Here's my interview with John Marco Cerezi. John Marco Cerezi, welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, I'm excited to talk to you. We're going to talk today about casting workshops and agent workshops, sometimes known as Pay to plays. That's what we've heard. Sometimes we've heard the term pay to play or paid audition. You're paying usually to see a casting director, to see an agent, to see a manager in these things. Let's use the term casting workshop, agent workshop, manager workshop, something like that for this discussion. And this is a reality for a lot of actors, especially in big cities like New York City and L.A. They have to pay to see a casting director, pay to see an agent, pay to see a manager. So I understand that you have gone on quite a journey with respect to these. And you have some great ideas for strategizing how actors spend their time and money in this direction. What are some of the companies that you've used? Let's see. When I moved here, I used one-on-one -on -one a lot, but then I learned about Actors Connection, Actors Green Room, The Network, TVI Studios. There's a small one called The Network East. There was one called Actors Corner. And there's even more now. There's many more than even when I moved here. I mean, it's a booming business. You counted off seven. Uh, I can think of another one, Stand Up Showcase. That's one that I've gone to. You just blew me away with how many there are. And I imagine when you came to this city, how long ago did you move here? It's 2015. So in... 2012, I would say, yeah. So you came to the city and then you eventually sought out these kinds of venues. Is that it? Yeah, I, I moved here and I graduated college with a degree in musical theater. I moved to be in an acting company, which was kind of off the map. So when I moved to New York, it very much felt like I was at the beginning. I had no agent. I had no real connections. My school was in Florida, so I didn't really have any community to speak of. So it was kind of like, okay, what do I do? And I turned to the casting director workshops and it seemed just, you know, I could plunk down some money and see someone and begin to learn about the industry really quickly. And the, the one benefit I had was, you know, I had my parents still supporting me. And it was a huge leg up that I cannot dismiss. Supporting you financially? Supporting me financially and above and beyond to the point where I could take an enormous amount of these classes. You know, there's so many different avenues to go about being an artist or just to build a career. But that was the one that seemed the easiest to grasp to just sign up for so many classes. And it really felt like, oh, this will be the easy road. Like I will meet this person, they'll bring me in for this show and eventually I'll book something and then everything will come together. It worked to a certain extent, but I spent an egregious amount of money, I think in the first year, easily, easily over $12,000. I'm, I'm, not, oh. I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, it feels, but out of that, I figured I got an agent, I got a manager, I freelance with a lot of commercial, finally signed with a commercial, and I made that money back. You know, looking back, I rebounded from that, but I think I could have strategized a lot better 
which is one of the reasons why I want to talk about it. This is why I love having you on. As I was considering you as a guest, you pitched me for many topics to talk about. And this one was exciting because I, too, as an actor, am faced with going to these kinds of workshops. And I'm confused about where I should spend my money, with whom I should spend my time, what's going to be most effective for me. And here in you, you're someone who spent not only real money, you spent a ton of money. And with that, you got a lot of experience and exposure within this kind of system. And I'm presuming you've got a really good sense of how to strategize, how to spend your money more wisely. Your insights, I'm guessing, we're going to give actors who are listening to this podcast shortcuts in a way. And maybe they're not shortcuts, but at least a method for making better choices when it comes to these. So help me understand how you strategized choosing the places you went to when you were meeting casting directors and agents and managers. Well, I think what have my is my objective changed so clearly. I think originally I came in and my objective and my strategy was, oh, I'm going to meet the legit casting directors because I want to be on Girls. I want to be on Louie. So I'm going to meet those people and get in through that way. And I kind of looked at casting directors almost like a, I, I grew up on Pokemon and this kind of a got to catch them all feeling where it was like, I'm going to meet every casting director. And there was a while, there's more that participate now, but there was a while that Every cast director who taught workshops, I found them and I met them and eventually evolved to a point where I said, you know what? You got to get the team together. It's about getting that team of reps together because without it, these people will see you maybe once and they will forget about you. I mean, when you've I've, I've run into enough people who told me once at a cast director workshop that was perfect. I have no notes who don't know me three months later. That certainly isn't everyone, but it's happened enough that I quickly realized, oh, I need to establish my agent. I need to establish my commercial agent. I need to look for a manager. And that became the priority. And that's when things shifted. So you started with the objective of getting the casting directors, and then you eventually shifted into getting the attention of agent and managers. Yes. Now, I still met with casting directors. And what happened was a lot of my agents, the people that I met with who were initially interested, I had relationships with casting directors that I could ask them for a reference. You know, that was indispensable. But I should have been seeking that out. Like, instead of trying to meet all the cast director, find the few that I click with, instead of taking one night, take the one that's six times. So you really get to know one casting director. So sometimes, you know, they'll have a one night off or they'll have one where you meet once every week for four weeks or six weeks. Better those every time because it's not about meeting them all because they'll forget you unless you're in some very particular situation where you look a specific way. But I mean, for me, I'm a mid-20s, slightly awkward white guy. There's no shortage of me. No one's going, oh, we need a mid-20s white guy. Who do we get? How do we fill this audition? The agents can't find them. Oh, John Marco. So, so it's about getting that team. And then also what I found is that it was like commercials. Commercials were the avenue to go down first because commercials, first of all, they made me some money so I could continue this absurd lifestyle and the amount of money that I was spending. But also it made me make money to a point where I could then try to get a manager because I was actually a client that a manager would want to have because I could possibly bring in some income as we would navigate the more tricky, legit territory. So that's, those were the two big things. It sounds like you were spending money on opportunities that might make you money. So you were spending money on the commercial direction in the hopes that that might generate the money to fund this kind of pursuit. Yes, and the commercials. You've talked about commercials on this podcast before. Commercials are becoming a lot more narrative. You can get fantastic footage. You can meet fantastic directors. But I do think especially playing this game, which is an expensive game, that you need to have money on your mind. This isn't an artistry thing. This is a business thing. You need to look at it like a business person. And so for me, I said, you know, this costs a lot of money. I need to figure out what's going to get me in rooms. And I found that commercials have actually... I've had lots of fulfillment creatively from commercials, and it's allowed me to pursue other things because I can make money. Was the pursuit of commercials from the beginning, or did you evolve into that? You know, when you first started out, you were pursuing casting directors, and you evolved into agents and managers. Did it then move into commercial focus, or was it commercial focus from the beginning or soon after you started? It, it was definitely more like legit theatrical focus at the beginning. I know so many actors who have like a real a hump to get over about doing commercials. They really feel like, no, I don't do commercials. And, and I think it, it takes very little time for you like, no, that's a ridiculous position to take. And also that it doesn't get in the way of your artistry at all. And then there's a lot of casting directors who do both commercials and legit. It happens all the time. And you're much more likely to get into that room for commercial because they're seeing a lot more people. Or if you're non-union, they're seeing, you know, a different group of people than for their legit projects. 
And on that note, I just recently actually joined the union, but it's been three years in New York without the union. And that's coupled with this because part of that pursuit of commercials was being non-union. There's a lot of casting directors who pretty much just cast non-union stuff. And even if you're going to go down a legit route, there are some non-union things. There's the whole investigation discovery track where there's so many shows casting that are non-union. There's lots of non-union work. So I think also to be non-union behooves you as you begin this process and kind of take my own prescription for how to go about it. Well, it sounds like being in the union now, your direction is probably going to still evolve insofar as you continue going to these things. It sounds like it's going to change whom you might work with. Yeah, it's just to get into a TV audition or a movie audition. It's so much infinitely harder. And I would say even specific on that end, go for the people who cast the TV shows that have 24 episodes a season over the ones who cast a couple movies occasionally. Now, that's certainly not to say there are some cast directors who do the occasional movie who are amazing teachers. And if you're going for the teaching, that's totally different. I mean, you can disregard what I'm saying if you're going for the teaching. There's different criteria you need to look at. But if you're looking at it as I want to get into auditions and I want this to lead to more money so I can do other things, you need to look at what's going to get you in the room. And the people that are casting one movie a year, if there's a part that you're right for and they remember you – It's just so slim. It seems like the people who are casting the films might have a smaller amount of jobs, but the people who are casting television might have a larger handful of jobs. What does that mean? More actors potentially. And they run out of actors. I got very lucky too. I got my first TV legit job out of almost disobeying what I'm saying now, which is why I say like, you know, don't not see any legit people. But I got my first TV job on Blue Buds by meeting a casting director and we clicked and she brought me in for a producer session and I booked it and it was great, but that's so rare. And and it it was one of those shows that that does 24 episodes a year. So they run out of New York actors. And that's what you want to look for. In episode two of this podcast, I talk about the difference between rules and principles. And I think that understanding the difference between rules and principles is helpful, at least for an actor like me. When I think of what you're saying is rules, I'm going to think of all the exceptions. And it's like, ah, I would think what you're saying is, is just not right. But when I realize it's principles and you're talking about things that apply in general, but not in all cases, of course, there are going to be exceptions. But there are paths to take that might generate more potential for success. And while going to see the casting directors outright might not lead to success, every once in a while, you're going to have that blue bloods experience. Experience. The problem is people sell the exceptions and, you know, it's so easy to fall for the exceptions and think that that's the path. But you really have to look at it like as if you were investing stocks. I mean, because it costs so much money, you can't be silly about it. You just have to think very strategically and be OK with that. Doing that isn't going to ruin you as an artist. It's just taking care of yourself and you're putting in money. you got to think about it. I agree. Let's take a step back. You said you moved from casting directors to focusing on agents and managers. Where did you spend your money when it came to focusing on them? How did you put your attention on them? I think you said that you used some of the casting director recommendations. Are there other ways that you chose agents and managers? I would meet with them for seminars or for these class sessions. And then sometimes with like commercial, for example, they would send you out on one or two auditions. And then a lot of times, if you get lucky and you get that far, if you don't get a call back on those first or second or third, they end up forgetting about you very quickly. And that's just part of the game. And that's part of people having so many clients. But in my case, it was just if they cooled off, like if they sent me out for two and I didn't book one of those two, which is very easy to do. After a while, I would maybe ask a casting director like, hey, could you put in a good word for me here? I mean, I'd be very selective about it. You know, you can only use these favors so many times. But also what I did is once I got those agents interested in me, for a while I was freelancing with, I think, three or four commercial agents. I would then tell them once a week, maybe once every two weeks, you know, hey, just wanted to let you know I took a recurring class with so-and-so. And then what do you know? I'd get brought in for so-and-so. It's a delicate balance. I have gone too far. I've reminded people of my existence too much at times. But I almost say better to lean towards that than the other because there's nothing bad that can happen, really. Do you have any recommendation for an actor, say, who's just moved to the city, who's visiting one of these casting workshop places, and is just seeing a list of agents and managers? How do they discern which ones are worth their attention and which ones aren't? How do they research? How do they focus that? Do you have any guidance or recommendations? Agents and managers are tricky. I think it's more it's better to talk to actors. You can go to IMDb Pro and like look at their clients, especially with legit. You can look like, oh, this is a stretch. Like to get with this agent, this agent is one of the top 10 agencies in New York. That's going to be tricky. So I think that's a matter of kind of talking around town. You end up learning it, but I don't really think there's a reliable way to do it on your own per se. Commercial, there's like eight or 10 agencies that basically handle most of the SAG commercials. And you can just ask any actor who those are. But then there's others who do a lot of non-union work. 
one of the things that's good to do is look for the deals like Actors Connection, one that I always recommend, and I'm not endorsed by Actors Connection by any means. They have like a seminar package and you have unlimited seminars for like a 30 day period or something. And if you have nights free and you're moving here, just go nuts. You know, it costs 200 something dollars and you could get many hundreds of dollars worth out of that because there is a lot of it where you just have to go to enough Q&As that you pick up all the little things. None of it's broken down anywhere. And you, you have to get a feel for it. I got a feel for it and still kind of hit my head against the wall for too long, hence the large price tag. So you spent $12,000, give or take, over the course of a year. About how long into that process did you start to notice, oh, something's starting to happen for me? Probably eight months or nine months. And it was commercials. What happened, I got very lucky I got a legit agent very quickly, but then no auditions. I'm sure as many people, you know, you come here and I was getting the breakdowns at the time. I don't get them anymore. But I remember like being like, oh, look, there's a part in this movie and there's a part in that movie and that TV show. And I'd email my agent and be like, hey, just wanted you to know, here's 15 parts I'm right for. And I was like, I, yes. And then, you know, you're never brought in for anything. So I got that legit agent quite early, but never brought in for anything for months. And then commercials. And then it was like, boom. Now I feel like I'm part of the industry. Now I'm going out. Now I'm figuring out how this whole system works. Now I'm talking to other working actors. Now I'm getting brought to casting directors who like me, who call me back, who bring me in for other things. And it got to the point where then I could look for a manager. And I'm kind of a big proponent of managers because the legit world can be so tricky that I think getting a manager is a good idea. A lot of people go like, well, I don't want to give another 10%. And I go, what's 10% of zero? To have a team is worth so much. Of course, you can be abused. Of course, there's people who aren't great. But at the beginning, I say the more people on your team, the more people you can freelance with, the more people who can send you out for things, the better. I'll give up a huge percentage as long as I'm auditioning. Aside from the commission for a manager, how does your manager and agent work together? What's the relationship of your team? How do they all work? If my agent gets appointments, they just email and CC my manager. And now I have more commercials and I have theater stuff. So my manager knows when I'm available, when I'm not, and they can respond. And, you know, they decide amongst themselves who handles a contract. If my manager gets me appointment, they just let the agent know. So it's pretty smooth. And the manager just takes care of things. I'm starting to get busier. And a lot of people go like, you know, get a manager when you need it. And I disagree because it's so hard to get to that point better to have more advocates on your side so you can get to that point where a manager feels really necessary. So I've gotten to a point now where like my manager has helped me in so many different ways, whether it's booking flights, whether it's figuring out time things, whether it's figuring out holds, that now it feels like I need a manager. When I first got them, I don't think it was like I need the manager, but they're the ones who got me to the place that I did. Would you recommend an actor starting out start targeting agents over managers or agents and managers? I, I think agents and managers, I think it really doesn't matter. There's so many managers who function in a way that's you can't differentiate them from agents. Some function more as like a traditional manager. Some function as agents. I know people have just been with managers for two years and have a wonderful career. You just find people when you're signing things, you know, when you're signing those exclusive contracts, that's when you need to take a breath and be like, is this the right move? But especially with freelance, freelance away, <laughs> freelance away. Well, as far as taking a breath and thinking about what you're doing, when it comes to these kinds of situations, when it comes to casting workshops, agent workshops, manager workshops, there comes with it ethical issues. What are some of the ethical issues that actors face when they go to these kinds of events? Well, it's like like that, that one name we discussed, pay to play. It's against the SAG rules. You're not supposed to pay to get auditions. That kind of corrupts the system. Some of these workshops, cast director or someone will make very clear, this is a coaching. This is not an audition. But I would say most of us, you know, it's clearly an audition. I don't think it's as unethical as some people fear because the most that they could do is bring you in for an audition. These cast and directors rarely are making the final decision. They can't just get you on a TV show. They can bring you in the room at best. And they're not fools. They don't want to show their producers a bad actor who happened to have given them a lot of money multiple times. That's not worth what their job is, which is where they're getting the majority of their income. I think the ultimate issue is you have an industry where you just have far too much supply every day, more and more supply, and just not enough demand. And in any kind of world like that, you're going to run into a slew of problems like these. But the question is, what's the alternative to getting seen? So I look at it and I go, okay, I came here and I felt very much out of the loop and I didn't have any agent, I didn't have any manager. What else could I have done? 
And there also is the thing that the casting director, they're not getting paid to do this otherwise. We can say, well, you have an ethical responsibility to go see 100 fringe shows this summer. They don't have the time and they're not getting paid so egregiously that, you know, they have the responsibility to take up their free time seeing everyone's little show. So if we got rid of these workshops, what's the alternative? How do you get in somewhere? And, you know, the whole world, all the way from colleges, there's a lot of this has to do with money. I was just talking to my friend who went to, you know, a Juilliard showcase. Juilliard's an expensive school. And, yeah, they paid money to get into that school. And then that school got them in front of a lot of industry. So money is at play in the world, period. I would rather there be an opportunity like this to get in front of people than none. And there's also, alter- I mean, you can end up becoming a reader at a lot of these places. I was a reader at one-on-one. I'm a reader at Actors Connection. I'm a reader at the network. It's tapered off. But even who is spending all the money, I must have been a reader for over 100 classes. And from that, I learned a lot. And all of those were free. So, you know, you can be, again, strategic and you can find a way that you can still participate without spending the kind of money I did. And it's just an unfortunate nature of society that you have to spend money. But I don't know what the alternative is by getting rid of these. Well, over the course of that year of spending a lot of money, did you see some of the same names pop up that you thought, I don't know if I really want to see this person? How did you make a decision where someone was seriously looking at talent or someone was perhaps exploiting talent? I think you just learn from what you hear around. You hear what your friends are called in for. You kind of can look on Actors Access and like, I'll just say the name, like Liz Lewis Casting cast so many, so many commercials and so many short films. Like all of them are great to meet because, and I see them. I see it on Actors Access. I see it on Casting Networks. I know from that from friends who've been brought in for appointments, for appointments they've brought me in, like, oh, that's totally worth to meet that team because they're working all the time and they will give you opportunities. But I think you learn and sometimes you learn the hard way. Again, I've run into so many people that I'm like, I spent $500 to meet with them four times over the course of four weeks. Maybe they gave me some notes. Maybe in some cases they said, oh, you're you're great. I have no notes. And then they don't recognize who you are. And you go, crap. Did I waste my money? And sometimes you did. And sometimes that's the risk. Well, that's a perfect segue. So now let's talk to that actor who has, let's say, a small bundle of money. It's a bundle, but a small bundle. And it's deciding where to spend that money. Can you give us some general tips for how to decide on where to spend that money? I first look for the packages. Always look for the packages because they're just going to be more bang for your buck. What's a package? The monthly unlimited deal. Look for the series of classes over the course of a week where you meet. 20 casting directors in one week. Ultimately, those are cheaper than doing it a la carte. And I did it a la carte. That's the most expensive way that you can do it. You mean not cheaper, you mean more affordable. They might cost a little bit more money, but per casting director or per agent, the cost is down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look for those things. And also with those, especially if you're new, some of these places will have a coach outside of the casting directors because the casting director's job is casting. But sometimes it's nice if some of these organizations, they have someone who will oversee everything and just talk to you about what kind of what I'm talking about now, but more specific to you, what your strategy is, where are all the jobs going to be for your specific look or age or whatnot. And that's what's nice because when you do it the other way, no one is accountable. No one's looking out for you and you need that person to tell you. Do you mean someone at an organization whose job is to help an actor choose classes from that organization? Sure. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they come as part of these package deals where you'll have like a general with this person, actors green room. They have people who, you know, very specifically will coach you and will oversee the classes you take and they'll be able to check in with them because otherwise you're doing it like I did where you're learning on the fly. And, you know, I have this knowledge now, but it took a year and as as I said, $12,000 to get it. How much is too much money to spend on a person? How much is the sweet spot for you? I mean, it's changed so much. Now I don't really do much anymore. But I'd say I wish these classes wouldn't go above $75. I honestly wish they would be $50. It depends on what you're getting. Some of these classes, they're smaller and you're actually working on the signs a lot. Then another class you're working on under five, which while an interesting thing to work on, like under five, you know, or that one line co-star part, if you're there and you say the line twice and you paid $129 for it, that's rough. That's really (laughs) rough. You know, it's such a mixed territory because I think there's a disclaimer at the end of these things from SAG saying, you know, this is not what it is. This is not a paid audition. And I think there is kind of a tricky territory that even casting directors have to navigate for themselves where it's like, 
Do I keep track of the people? I've had some guest directors where it's like the class, they brought in everyone from that class for an audition at some point. And I've had others where that certainly was not what they were going to do. So we're starting to wind down. I have a few more questions. So I want to talk about what the different companies are out there from what you can think of and what characterizes them, what makes them different from others. Uh, But first, before we talk about that, I want to see how do you handle conflicts that come up when you've scheduled a class or a workshop or something? Maybe you booked an acting job on the same day that you have uh, one of these casting workshops at the end of the day. How do you handle that? Does it depend on different companies? Well, I think the good news was when I first started, there were no acting gigs that were conflicts. But I think most places are pretty flexible because there are a lot of working actors, even actors with great representation. Actors, sometimes if you have great representation who are really going to get you a lot of legit auditions, then it behooves you to start seeing these legit casting directors more exclusively because your new agent will actually get you in the room. So I was thinking about that because there are lots of professionals who do these classes and most every place that I've been to has been very flexible. If you need to come in late, if you need to leave early, they'll work around it. Unfortunately, they're also very much, you know, if you miss it, you lost the money because they could have made that money with someone else. So there isn't really much of a forgiveness policy on missing it for a gig. And it's kind of assumed if you got a gig, you made some money, you might as well lose it now. Sometimes I felt that way too. I've been wrestling with that. I will have booked stand-in work or background work on a project. And usually that makes a conflict for the whole day. And that has prevented me from trying to book these things or if I book them and then get a job ah but I've also weighed whether I eat that cost but this is a perfect segue into talking about what characterizes some of the different ones that come to mind and you listed seven or eight of them at the top that's okay if you don't mention them all what are the big ones to you and what characterizes them the main ones that I was at was like one-on-one the network Actors Connection and Actors Green Room. I think those were the four big ones when I came here. And I would say that those are the four big ones, at least that I know of. There's others like TVI has been around longer, but I just didn't find out about them. But those are the ones that have the most classes going on all the time. Now, is one-on-one require an interview of some sort? Yes, actually, that's a good point, is that one-on-one does require an audition to get in. Though I believe the rate of acceptance, at least when I first was there, was around 70%. In all honesty, I don't think in a double-blind experiment you'd be able to tell. You know, every class will have the occasional person where you're like, oh, I wish the cast director would tell you you should take an acting class. And that's unfortunately something that's not necessarily their obligation to do. And then you kind of get people who really should, you know, take an acting class as opposed to just taking workshop after workshop after workshop. Has one of these companies been more successful for you for spending your money? I don't think so. I think Actors Connection had a lot of great seminars and that's ended up where I gravitating because I think at the time doing those seminars, which usually are around like $30, $25, $40, that became the more affordable option. Sometimes I look at Actors Green Room and I look at the attention that they'll, you know, if you really go through their program, if you kind of look at their program almost as its own schooling system, they'll give you a lot of individual attention. By the time I learned about Actors Green Room, I had already studied with so many of the casting directors that went through there that it was kind of like, well, it's not worth the money now to go through their whole system. But I do see them kind of take care of their own. And I think that's nice to try to do is, again, to find someone who's accountable and to find someone who's looking out for you is good to do if you can. But at the end of the day, a lot of these, it's pretty much the same. It's just different rooms. And a lot of the casting directors will go through them all. Some cast directors have exclusive contracts or agreements where they're only will go to one or two. I know some who have will only be at one-on-one and Actors Connection or some who we used to be only at TVI and then I signed up for them and then they came to one-on-one the very next week. But other than that, you know, it's kind of the same people and you just can compare the prices for yourself. I don't know what the price points are at this juncture. No problem. Let's give a big old asterisk to what you say and say anyone who's listening to this and is hearing about one of these companies should do their own research and figure out what the differences are, what the policies are for each company. I mean, you're a person, you're not affiliated with any of these companies. So obviously, go directly to them. John Marco Cerezi is not an authority on these things. Yeah, and talk to people. I mean, and, and I think, as you were saying, I think it is important because they are actor-centric institutions, and I feel this about all actor-centric institutions where your business is coming from actors, that those that are more flexible to things like last-minute conflicts will always get my vote. Because I think if your business is going to be actors and you know what the business is and you know how it works, you should be very forgiving to that because those are the people whose money you're getting. And when people aren't, that can be very upsetting because it's like, we're all struggling here and you're making money off the struggle. And that's fine. Again, as I've said, like I couldn't be where I am without it, 
But I think, look at that too. I think that's an important aspect to consider. John Marco, thank you so much. Let's summarize a little bit of what you said. This is what I picked up. When it comes to maximizing your acting goals, granted, every actor is different and their goals are different. Prioritize the commercial auditions, the commercial casting workshops over the theatrical legit ones. Focus on agent and manager workshops over casting workshops as a primary. Try to go to the places that have some kind of consultant who can refer you to different classes. Perhaps you need to get over your artistic ego and see what commercial acting has for you and how it can benefit you as an actor. And I'll say one last really important thing that I wish I had said to myself is that I think I really just leaned on these for an entire year, just these workshops. And it wasn't until I got my first TV gig where I had, you know, one line where I was like, oh, this isn't everything. And I finally produced a play at the fringe, which is to say, try to do both. Be the businessman and be the artist. Be the businessman or woman and be the artist. Because also, when you go to these things, the more you have to talk about outside of going to cast director workshops, no cast director cares if you did another cast director workshop, but do both. Have those creative projects. Do that play in the weird thing. Go take your improv classes. Go write your children's book. Because when you do have those moments where you talk to the people, then you have this exciting creative life outside of it. Maybe you'll even have opportunities to invite them to things. It's rare that, you know, they're going to come see your play at the Secret Theater in Queens, but you have something to talk about. And that was my mistake is it took me a year before I said, oh, okay, this can only go so far and I'm missing an ingredient. And I finally had kind of two halves of my life, creative, making my own projects, that would be wonderful if they get seen by people, but I'm doing it to fulfill myself and the business of the business. John Marco Cerezi, you spent $12,000 on these kinds of things and you made it back. I want to thank you for sharing your experiences to the Acting Income Podcast. Thank you so much for coming. It was an honor. Thank you for having me. Cheers. And cheers indeed. <laughs> Man, there is so much John Marco says in this interview. I hope you took notes. One last thing. I've done my share of casting director workshops. I've also heard quite a few horror stories about them. Back in 2012, I got together with Mandy Mae Cheatham, an actor friend of mine, and we started experimenting with flip cams and improv. Our premise? Casting director workshops. Our little experiments with flip cams and improv turned into a 10-episode web series. And over the course of our web series, we cover just about every bad scenario we've experienced or could imagine happening in one of these. Our little web series is basically one actor comes in to see one casting director nine different times. Each episode is her few minutes of glory with the same casting director. The series has been repeatedly described as hilarious and painful. <laughs> I, I hope you'll watch because I think you'll identify. The web series is called The Infinite Need. And the series is on YouTube and also at theinfiniteneed.com. It's also linked in the show notes. Thanks again to John Marco Cerezi for spending $12,000. I saw none of it. <laughs> and that's the show. This episode was sponsored by the FICOR Workbook from FICOR Central. To download the FICOR Workbook, visit FICORcentral.com slash workbook. The show notes for this episode are available at actingincome.com slash episode 22, where you can also leave a comment on this episode. You can also find Acting Income on Twitter and Facebook. Rate review this podcast on iTunes by visiting actingincome.com slash iTunes. Pitch an episode idea by visiting actingincome.com slash pitch. And if you'd like to sponsor an episode, check out actingincome.com slash advertise. I'm Ben Houck, or am I? And for more information, as always, check out actingincome.com. 